production of Ruckus is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, the Hartwig family, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Ruckus, our weekly food for thought fight over the news of the day and the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon. The Ruckettes join me shortly in our topics this week. In Lee Summit schools, how much is too much? On streetcar expansion, how soon is too soon? And how many people know what a libertarian is? Plus roast and toast. But we start with our newsmaker segment and talk with someone whose name comes up, may I say, frequently during our discussions on Ruckus. Chris Kobach is the Kansas Secretary of State, a Republican re-elected to a second term in 2014. Kobach has gained national attention for his legal work on immigration cases and voter fraud issues, winning high praise from many conservatives, less positive reactions from some others. There's a lot to talk about, so let's get started. Welcome Kansas Secretary of State Chris Kobach. Mr. Secretary, Chris, good to see you again. Good to see you, Mike. You're elected statewide as a Republican. The Republicans control the Kansas legislature and the governor's mm -hmm. office. You were once the executive director of the Kansas Republican Party, as I recall. Uh, chairman. Chairman of the Kansas Republican mm -hmm. Party. Uh, there seem to be a lot of issues, a lot of concern about what's going on in Kansas, and Republicans are being blamed for the problems. What would you assess as the state of the Kansas GOP? Uh, I'd say the Kansas GOP is in, in a strong position right now. You look at the numbers, uh, we do control all of the statewide uh, offices. Uh, if you look at the numbers in the House, uh, 97 out of 125 House members are Republican. In the Senate, it's 32 out of 40. So those are pretty strong numbers. Actually, though, in the, in the House, even though the numbers are so overwhelming, the, many of those Republicans will tend to vote with the Democrats. They, you know, they're elected in districts where you can't be elected unless you're a Republican, and so they will, they're essentially Democrats. Well, there's an election coming up in November, and some people are saying this will be a year when lots of Republicans are turned out of office. Uh, I doubt that. I don't think you'll see the Republican numbers shift that much. Um, what you might see is some real battles in the primaries. There, there still is a liberal Republican versus conservative Republican fight in many districts in Kansas. So I don't think you'll see the Republican share of the legislature versus Democrats change much. I think you will see some of that fighting in the primaries get pretty intense. You've been a constitutional law professor, so would you help me understand the Kansas Constitution and what the Supreme Court thinks the legislature should be doing with regard to school finance? Well, you know, it all goes back to the Kansas Supreme Court's mistake and misinterpretation uh, of the phrase that the, the the phrase suitable education or suitable uh, provision for yeah, financing. The, the phrasing it says the, the legislature shall make suitable provision for the financing of education. It doesn't say shall give each child a suitable education which the court has twisted it to mean. It just says make a provision for some, some combination of, of property taxes and other taxes that will finance education. But the Kansas Supreme Court has, has lifted that word suitable out of context and stuck it in front of the word education, meaning we, the Supreme Court, get to tell you, the legislature, how much spending is suitable. And as a result, we see largely liberal groups going to the court every time they lose in the legislature saying this is not enough, this is not enough, and, and it's been a, a horrible and, miscarriage of justice. And the Supreme justice. Court saying you're right, you're right, it's well, not we, enough, yeah, and we, there are two cases we, pending. Do we, you think we, we'll see that again? Um, chances are yes, because the court is so liberal. Uh, it's, it's no uh, myth. It's, it's widely known the Kansas Supreme Court is one of the most liberal state Supreme Courts in the country, and that's largely due to our selection method, uh, which is, by the way, called the Missouri system. That was yeah. our first mistake when we uh, adopted <laughs> that back in the 50s. Um, so anyway, it's uh, it, chances are the Supreme Court will order the legislature to spend more money, as they always do. But uh, I think people are finally starting to realize this is a problem. It's not the court's job to set how much money Kansas yeah. taxpayers spend. Uh, very quickly, if the court does rule more money has to be spent, do the governor and the legislature have any choice about that? Well, it depends on the timing, right? So if it happens uh, early in a legislative session where there are still lots of options on the budget table, then the legislature can play a, a greater role. Or in, in the Montoy decision a decade ago, the governor had to call a special session of the legislature. But, so a lot of it depends but on we, the timing. We hear people talk about a constitutional crisis. Uh, ultimately, the state legislature and governor must comply with the court order? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, there are many people who've said, well, you know, at, at what point, if the court goes farther and farther away from the text of the Kansas Constitution, at what point does the yeah. legislature say, well, we can't? But, you know, so far the, the legislature and the governor have consistently said, okay, well, we'll try to comply even though we disagree. We're down to just a few seconds. You're known for your concern about illegal immigration. Yes. Is that why you're supporting Donald Trump's bid for the White House? That's one of many reasons. I mean, he stands head and shoulders above the other Republican candidates now that the race is over. But, he, you know, he was clearly the one leading the charge. And he was speaking frankly about illegal immigration in a way that previous presidential contenders had not. So that certainly brought me toward the Trump campaign. Uh, his conservative positions on other positions solidified my, my support for him, and I'm glad to see he'll be. Would you like to advantage. serve in his administration? I haven't been offered anything, and so okay. I would, would, it'd be hard to answer that question. Steve Rose uh, opines that you're going to run for governor, and it would be. Uh, the likely choice for the GOP nominee. Are you interested in being governor? I haven't made any decision. I'm looking seriously at it. Uh, got a long, you know, we're still two and a half years away from the 2018 election, but uh, have not made any decision. Got to stop you there. Great to see you again. Thanks very much for coming Great in. Great to be with you, Mike. Kansas Secretary of State Chris Kobach. Now let's meet the panel and start a ruckus. Jim Heater is a former city councilman and until recently president of the Greater Kansas City Chamber of Commerce. Author and publisher Annie Presley joins us for the first time. Terry Riley is a former council member and now heads Transformation Consultants. And Crosby Kemper III is head of the Kansas City Library System and host of KCPT's Meet the Past. Thanks to all of you for coming in. Let's get going. It may seem like only yesterday that streetcar service began on a two-mile track in downtown Kansas City. But it's actually been all of three weeks, and its early success is enough to convince enthusiasts that it's time to start expanding the line from Union Station to the plaza and then on to UMKC. Kansas City Star columnist Steve Kraske thinks the KC Regional Transit Alliance will announce a major expansion plan in the next few weeks. Of course, announcing a plan is just a start. Much would have to follow, messy details like an election to get local funding and lobbying to try for federal grants to help finance the costly system. So the question becomes, should Kansas City move forward on expansion immediately or wait a few months, maybe a year before deciding? We'll start with Jim. Mike, I think, uh, I think Kansas City should um, begin work immediately on expanding the streetcar system uh, south along Main Street uh, through the plaza and actually then looping over to UMKC. Um, if you traverse Main Street, you see that it's off to a great, great start. Riders are riding it and you see enormous economic growth and development that's occurred along the route of the existing streetcar line, which you can expect to occur as it goes south. I think it'd be terrific for the city to link downtown proper, Crown Center, the plaza, and then also to connect to the UMKC area. We have an extraordinary collection of assets there. Rockhurst University, UMKC, the Stowers Institute, Kaufman, the Nelson Art Gallery, and it goes on. Um, and it would be great to, for Kansas Citians and visitors to be able to ride the streetcar to those. How's those that venues. going to be financed? Uh, probably through the same system that uh, that the initial streetcar the line transportation was development district. I where think that's a, yes. Property I, owners in that district, people yes. who live in that district, decide yeah. whether property and sales taxes would I be increased. I think that's correct. There will be public vote. And it'll be financed in much the same way. Although it's also possible that there could be additional sources of financing. That would be a good thing as well. All right, Annie Presley, welcome to Ruckus. Thank good you. to see you again. Uh, what are your thoughts about expanding the streetcar line? Should there be a decision made immediately, or should we wait a while and see? if this early enthusiasm continues. There are reasons for both, Mike. Jim's right. There's a lot of enthusiasm right now, and the Obama administration does have a proclivity toward federal finance funds for streetcars, and we want to jump on that if we want to go forward. But on the other hand, the um, funding that they did do downtown in that new district was very controversial. The UMKC folks turned down the opportunity for the, the, the neighborhood in UMKC turned down the opportunity to expand the streetcar. So there are some obstacles that we'd have to overcome pretty quickly if you wanted to move forward right away. Well, Crosby, you think this early enthusiasm will last? I, for example, went down last Sunday and rode the streetcar, and it will probably be the only time I ride it uh, in yeah, the near it, future. It, I mean, it was packed, it was crowded beyond capacity, I'm it, sure. It, it's a great amenity. I ride it every day. I'm the only actual commuter. I get on it at 6.50 to 7 a.m., and I'm, you know, frequently alone. 
Um, but it's a great amenity, and, and people are having a lot of fun on it. And, and it, it will always power and light amenity. The problem is there's no utilitarian reason for this. Steve Kresge uses that word in his column about it, if it's extended to Westport or whatever. If you, if where we are right now at 31st Street, it would take you 35 minutes to get to, get to work. Uh, if you're if you're working down at one of the banks, in other words, it's great for some people, but not it, for the it, vast majority it, yeah, of people. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a party bus essentially, it and it's a great it's the most yeah. expensive party bus uh, in town. But it, it is great for that. It's a great amenity, but it's very expensive. And who's paying for it? The average taxpayer in Kansas City makes twenty seven thousand dollars a year, and they're paying for this fun amenity. Terry, where do you come down on this question about expanding the streetcar line? I think there needs to be an analysis done as it relates to how we fund this. Uh, I've, I've ridden a streetcar with my uh, family. Uh, I think it's great, and it has created a buzz in downtown. And you have a number of people there from the early morning into the evening, and particularly down in the uh, uh, the city, River city market. market. Yeah. And I was just down to getting fruit a couple of days ago, and it was just packed. But there has to be an analysis done, and I think the mayor and the city council will, you know, work through this. And I will just let the mayor and the city council work through this to see how they finance this thing where it can be sustainable long term. Well, don't you think one of the reasons for its popularity is that it costs nothing? I mean, you can ride it, and, and you don't pay any you kind of a fare. Absolutely. But uh, what if it started to cost money, if the tax revenues weren't sufficient to support the district? I think it's a great question, Mike, because I think uh, I think as, if it's expanded, I think uh, it would not necessarily be free. That might actually be a fair charge. It may be subsidized. I suspect there probably would be a fair. I don't think that would uh, dampen enthusiasm for it, or and I don't think it would do anything to lessen the economic development that would occur along the there pathway. There is no the economic car. development from the streetcar per se. You know, there are these lists that come out that the downtown council puts out, or the streetcar authority, or the star. And they're all, it's all phony. You know, it's stuff like the Bryant Building or the library are on these lists, which have nothing to do with the streetcar were there before, or the big one. The downtown council just put out a billion dollar list of the streetcar. 308 million is the convention center hotel. They mentioned the 308 million. They failed to mention the 200 million dollars in tax subsidies that, are, that will go into this, uh, the, the convention center hotel should it ever be built. There's no real economic development out of this with a couple of exceptions. Well, with all due respect, I have to, I have to disagree, disagree strongly with that. All you have to do is ride that streetcar line and see the economic development and growth that is occurring on Main Street that would not have been there but for the street. Five to ten businesses on Main Street, sure, you're absolutely right. Five to ten businesses for 160 million that it will ultimately cost us with a streetcar and 150 million dollars a year in corporate tax subsidies, most of which are going into that neighborhood. I've got to wrap it up uh, out of time, but Crosby, you'll love this. One website I saw this statement, the worst thing about riding the streetcars is seeing all the vacant buildings downtown. A lot of them. And that, and that, that will change. That will change <laughs> yeah. on both sides of Main Street. Time will tell. With subsidies. All right, we're going to move on. It has all the elements of a fictional soap opera, big money, controversial romance, and people angered by both. But it may be all too real for students and patrons in the Lee Summit School District, where Superintendent David McGeehee is on administrative leave and may be leaving permanently. McGeehee is the highest paid school leader in the state, somewhere around $350,000 a year, and his romantic interest, Shelley Gwynn, leads a law firm that, until recently, handled the district's legal business, including McGeehee's employment contract. Without delving into the specifics of the case, because we don't know them, let's get into the general questions it raises. First one, does $350,000 a year seem like too much money for a superintendent in a school district of 18,000 students, we'll start with Terry Riley. Absolutely, yes. It's just, it's, it's too much. It's overkill. That coupled with uh, that relationship, it, it's, a, it's a direct conflict. And, and, and more and more, we're trying to find out different resources to make sure that our children are being uh, uh, fed academically. And it costs money. Uh, that can be a tutor. That can be a reading uh, teacher. That can be a number of different things. And so I think it's too much money. It's more than North Kansas City, more than Kansas City, Missouri School District. More than any other district any in the state of Missouri. And, and Kansas. Yeah. In, in Kansas. Yeah. Because well, there's no money in Kansas, you know that. Yeah, because Brownback, <laughs> but that's a different story. Oh, there we go again. Uh, Annie, the romantic relationship was disclosed by the superintendent to the board. And as I understand it, the board said, we understand, that's fine. It doesn't interfere with the legal activities of the uh, the firm or the school district's activities. Do you buy that? Are you comfortable with this relationship? 
I didn't really know anything about it, so I reached out to some friends who live out in Lee Summit and said, what's really going on? And they, they weren't bothered so much by the romantic relationship because it had been exposed earlier, but they were very, very concerned about the fact that Mr. McGee was unapproachable. He was non-transparent. Mm -hmm. And so there were activities that they wanted input from him and for him, which he was either not willing to share or not willing to listen to. So I think that was more of what the issue was with the parents and the people in Lee Summit, not so much the girlfriend. They were concerned that he wouldn't talk with them about school business, not about his private life and his relationship with the attorney. Right. Jim, how do you uh, look at this thing? You're an attorney. What, what do you think? <laughs> well, you know, is, I, I mean, is this proper for the attorney for the district being the romantic uh, portion of a relationship with the superintendent? I, I found this all very, very curious, um, actually pretty strange, both as a lawyer and as a person who served as an elected official in a public body. It seemed to me from the outset that the obvious thing to do was for the school district of Lee Summit to go elsewhere for legal services. There are a lot of great law firms around. In fact, they use other law firms. Are you available? Uh, I would not be available. I, I would not be a candidate he's, he's for that too role. too much of a romantic icon. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I think it would have been a good idea for the superintendent, for the law firm in the district, to disengage for that relationship to, to, to disengage, Absolutely. which has now occurred. But it seemed to me it should have occurred at the very beginning of all this. Mike, isn't it interesting in all this that nobody's talked about it? performance. Right. Um, he's the highest paid superintendent, I, I assume, of course, then that Lee Summit's the best performing school district in the state. In fact, that's not true. It's a decent school district, but it doesn't really outperform its demographics. Its uh, ACT scores are relatively low. Uh, below state average, and it's actually, been a downward decline over uh, the last three years. Yeah, exactly. So, so you know, I, they're, they're talking. You know, there there they're a lot of loosey goosey stuff going on. The Missouri State Auditor report is damning, but the real problem is nobody's talking about the really important thing you should be doing, which is educating the kids. Well, there were 400 or some number of that size patrons showing up one night at a school board meeting, and from what I could glean, it seemed they were concerned that the superintendent made too much money money that could have been put in the classroom for student activities or for teachers. That's right. And, and that's what I mentioned earlier. I mean, it's always a, I mean, you can use it for uh, college prep, uh, ACT training. Uh, there's a number of things and a number of trends that are happening out there in the school district uh, whereby you can use those funds to address those trends. Crosby, is this the, the proper role for patrons in a district to show up in large numbers and make demands on the school board? Well, I think you've got to, uh, 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 public education has always been based locally and also always been a, a political uh, activity. So, you know, I think, I think p parents have got to be involved. But I think they should really, pro one of the problems in Kansas City is we are not concerned enough with performance. Forget the Kansas City and KCK school districts. Talking about our best school districts, our best school districts are not performing where they ought to ought to perform and parents ought to be concerned with that yeah but the patrons elect the board to make decisions like they want to see changed. Well, yes. since I had to disagree with Crosby on the streetcar, I'm going to agree with him on, on this issue. Um, it, it, it's important for a school board to always stay focused on the kids, on, on the quality of education that's that's uh, that's being offered in the district. Uh, I'm sure that's what the school board in Lou Summit is is doing. I hope that's what they're doing. And this has been a distraction that was unnecessary. Let me wrap it up with a very quick question to Annie. Do you think students are paying attention to this? Yes, of course. I mean, they're watching it every day, and their parents are talking about it at the dinner table. Sex I, is involved. I think that <laughs> I think that meeting that you referenced is the one where the parents attended and they weren't yeah. heard. They weren't allowed to speak, and that's what caused the um, greater enthusiasm. All right, uh, Republicans say it, Democrats say it, people in neither party say it. We need a third choice. Voters disgruntled with the apparent nominees of both major parties may have what, for some, seems a viable option. The Libertarian Party will nominate two former Republican two-term governors, New Mexico's Gary Johnson for president and Massachusetts' Bill Weld for his running mate. The Libertarian Party will likely be on the ballot in all 50 states with a philosophy that generally promotes liberty and limited government, think Senator Rand Paul. It is hard to imagine Johnson winning the White House, but in a year of political unrest, is this the time voters will take a closer look at the Libertarian Party? Fortuitously and coincidentally, we happen to have on the panel this week the co-founder of a libertarian think tank, the Show Me Institute. So Crosby, 
Is this the year the public will start to pay well, attention well, to the libertarians? Pay more attention. I mean, Gary Johnson's already getting 10 percent in the in the polls, and you have the two candidates with the highest negatives in the history of American politics in uh, in Hillary Clinton and uh, Donald Trump, and you know the candidate of no principle versus the candidate of bad and changing principles. Uh, and so they're going to take a look at Gary Johnson, but I don't. I don't think. I don't think he's got a, a, a shot. I think Gary Johnson himself is an interesting guy, very articulate guy. But his primary issue has been legalization of drugs, yeah. and I think that's the country's not ready for that. I think Donald Trump is actually going to be our next president, and I think that that happened this week with the president's uh, uh, transgender uh, well, deciding to tell us yeah. where to go to the bathroom. Let me read a couple of excerpts from a statement of principles from the Libertarian Party. This is not all inclusive, it's just a brief summary, but let me read it. We'll put it on the screen so people can watch this. We believe that respect for individual rights is the essential precondition for a free and prosperous world, that forces and fraud must be banished from human relationships, and that only through freedom can peace and prosperity be realized. Sexual orientation, preference, gender, or gender identity should have no impact on the government's treatment of individuals, such as in current marriage, child custody, adoption, immigration, or military service laws. Government does not have the authority to define, license, or restrict personal relationships. Consenting adults should be free to choose their own sexual practices. I think what Gary Johnson, the presidential candidate uh, for the party, said the same thing Barry Goldwater said back in 1964, keep the government out of my pocket and out of my bedroom. What's your reaction? You know, uh, Mike, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm enough of a political junkie that I spend a great deal of time in my car listening on Sirius Radio to uh, POTUS, yeah. um, Politics oh, of the United right. States or People of the United States, depending on your point of view. Yeah. But, but uh, I have heard Gary Johnson, the former governor of New Mexico, interviewed at length on two occasions. Uh, I think the combination of uh, Governor Johnson as a presidential candidate, Governor, former Governor Weld of Massachusetts as a vice presidential candidate, they're both very articulate. Uh, I think the libertarian policy and its views, its platform will get a lot of exposure. I don't know the rules for national televised presidential debates, but if they are included in those yeah. debates, they'll get an awful that's lot of exposure. That's what they're hoping for. It's, I think it's 15 percent. You have I to think get that, 15 percent. I think that's exactly right. It's hard and, to know whether they'll draw from a Democratic candidate or a Republican candidate or perhaps both because they have, they have ideas and views that really uh, cross the spectrum. Making it too simple, I observed maybe this is conservatism without the social issues and without foreign intervention or liberalism without big government solving all problems. In any case, we'll leave that on the table. Let me ask you, Annie, since you're known as a successful fundraiser for Republicans, would it be easy to raise money for libertarians? Bill Weld is very capable. I've actually worked with him on behalf of some Republican candidates across the country, and he is well-spoken and, and understands the procedure well. The question I have is, to whom do they approach? Are they going to approach? And my my guess is that the millennials are going to be responding most effectively to that statement that you just read. And um, right now, there's a fair amount of millennials going for Clinton and Trump. So it's hard to say who they'll go after. And if the, if they go after that age group, then they'll have to use the electronic devices. And those tend to drive smaller numbers. So it's going to be a tough fundraising go for them. All uh, right, Terry, you're, uh, I assume, a Democrat. You <laughs> may be a you're liberal assume, Democrat. Uh, you're, you're do you find any Democrat. comfort in the uh, libertarian philosophy? Uh, I find comfort if, if he can uh, take votes away from Trump. <laughs> it will. Yeah. That will happen. Uh, you know what? I, I do believe it's time for a um, third party. A third party, uh, and I'm truly, I am a fan of uh, former, uh, uh, I was about to say governor, but Mayor Bloomberg. Uh, well, he's not going to run anyway. Right. He's, not, he's not running. The, 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 right. real, the real problem for Gary Johnson and the Libertarians is it, it, they need to be the party of change, and right now the people who want change want Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've got to move on and do quick toast. It's time now for Roast and Toast, where the Ruckheads offer exultation or denunciation to people and events of the news, and we start with Terry. Yes, unfortunately, uh, I have, well, fortunately, I'm toasting, uh, no, roasting um, uh, Secretary of State Kobach. Uh, he continues to move forward with his voter ID, and, and the truth of the matter is, over the last 10 years, there's been three cases, and they've been misdemeanors as it relates to voter fraud in the state of Kansas. Uh, he continues to want people to show their birth certificate, 
finger, uh, you know, uh, they, it, he, I, I think he probably wants your blood type when you go to the uh, uh, to vote, and he just needs to stop. Right. I, I don't understand. Amy. And so, roast. I'm toasting taxpayers today, and I want everybody to remember who they are. They're paying for subways. They are helping with libraries. They're paying superintendents at schools. And these folks who spend the taxpayers' money need to be mindful and thankful of those who are working and paying their taxes. Crosby. So uh, I, after having opposed the mayor on a lot of things like the streetcar and the convention center hotel, I want to say some nice things about Mayor Sly James, who's been a great leader. I think Jim's going to talk about this too, but a great leader in education. He's devoted a lot of time and effort, brought a lot of people together. We have some good performance uh, going on. He's worked really well as a partner with the library, the school district, and a lot of smaller not-for-profits. And uh, so I want to toast the mayor. Part two from uh, Jim. At, at the risk of, uh, of, of ringing with Crosby twice in the same episode of, of Rock and Side, <laughs> I'm going to follow suit. About a week ago, the Kansas City Star published this editorial, Casey Becomes a National Model in Boosting Third Grade Reading. And it's a nice toast by the Kansas City Star, which I would join in toasting Mayor Sly James, the Turn the Page Board, and all the associated partners and individuals, including the Greater Kansas City Chamber of Commerce, who are doing everything they can to get more of our kids to read at grade level in third grade. It's one of the most important things we can do in our community. And finally, here's a toast to the 90% of respondents in a recent Washington Post poll of 500 plus Native Americans who said they are not, not offended by the name Redskins for the DC football team. And why would they be? A team is named for something positive, not negative or insulting. The only people offended are those who prize political correctness and therefore promote solutions to non-existent problems. And that is Ruckus for this time. We're off for a couple of weeks, but we shall return on June the 16th. Now for the Ruckus and the crew, Mike Shannon saying thanks for watching and good night.